Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with performance and how to improve the human experience. Twice a week, I explore the latest science, technology, and tactics with experts in various fields of human optimization. I'm your host, Boomer Anderson. Enjoy the journey. Superhuman. It's Boomer, and we're back with another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. Today, we're going to talk about a personal obsession, productivity, building an external brain, an exocortex, or as my guest today likes to talk about, building a second brain. My guest today is Tiago Forte, and he's one of the foremost experts in the world on productivity. He writes and speaks about how knowledge workers can revolutionize their personal effectiveness using technology and has taught more than 20,000 people around the world through his online courses and live workshops. Personally, I've taken two of his courses, both Building a Second Brain and Getting Stuff Done, and I recommend them highly to people. They've had a high influence on how I handle my workflow and how I'm able to produce more with less time and less resources. Tiago writes about his ideas on his blog Praxis, and in a previous life, he worked in microfinance in Latin America, served in the Peace Corps in Ukraine, and consulted for large companies on product development in Silicon Valley. Tiago and I talked about why he decided to move to Mexico City. We talked about his organizational system, otherwise known as PARA, the inspiration he gets for his writing, networks, and of course, the Mesa Method. You can find more in the show notes at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Tiago. That's T-I-A-G-O. Enjoy my episode with Tiago Forte. Tiago, welcome to the show. Thank you, Boomer. I'm really happy to be here. So as a consumer of your, your content for a very long time, but also your courses, this is going to be an absolute pleasure for me. But as a fellow you know, American living abroad, I have to ask the question, and you and I were discussing this a little bit beforehand, why did you decide on Mexico City? Yeah, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm very, I've become very passionate about remote work um, and digital nomads. I think it's deeply entangled with the future of work and, and kind of the direction that work is moving. But Basically, the, the reasons for us personally were pretty practical. Um, well, a mix. So my my wife, we got married in April, uh, but have been together about seven years. Uh, she's Mexican American on both sides. Uh, grew up in a very you know Chicana environment in Southern California, um, but she's like third or fourth generation um, Mexican American, so didn't really have the the full Spanish speaking experience. Uh, despite being ethnically 100% Mexican. So she's had this this lifelong dream of kind of returning to her roots and reconnecting with her Mexican heritage and learning Spanish at a, at a higher level. Um, I've been working remotely for years. She worked at a bank, a nonprofit bank in downtown San Francisco. Um, and towards the end of last year, she quit. She left. And we suddenly um, almost just realized that we didn't need to be in the most one of the most expensive cities on the planet, <laughs> <laughs> um, and decided to take off. and And really, it was a short list of criteria, and Mexico City was the only one that fit. Okay, what was some of those criteria? So it was really just obviously Spanish speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, another second one was big city. We love cities. We love that culture and the cosmopolitan stuff. Um, close to North America, close to our, both our families live in Southern California in Orange County. Um, so needed to be not too far of a flight from Southern California. Um, I think that was it, just three criteria. And really there's only one major city that's not in the U S that's in North America that speaks Spanish. (laughs) (laughs) Fair point. Fair point. I guess, uh, you know, going down to Central America would be another option, but people have done that before. Um, can we talk a little bit, let, let's go into productivity because obviously I wanted you to come on the show to talk about productivity because I'm fascinated about your work in this space. 
First things first, you pull from many different influences when it comes to productivity. Do you mind just sort of recapping some of those for people? Where where gets where do you get your influences from when it comes to developing productivity theories? Yeah, that's that's sort of my my um I guess it's like my style or something, but um anywhere and everywhere. I really, mm-hmm. you know, I, I see the world as deeply interconnected, um, as deeply self-similar is another term. Uh, it's kind of fractal where the patterns at a very small level and the tiniest little thing get repeated and repeated and repeated at every different scale. Um, and I don't know if that's actually, faz- you know, factually, objectively true, if that's how the world is, but it's a lens that I use a lot and I find it leads to some incredible insights. You just see that that the, the the boundaries we put around you know fields and topics and disciplines and areas of expertise are made up you know and you can mm-hmm. you can make them up differently you can slice and dice the world in a different way and the way that i've chosen to slice it is what makes human beings more effective what makes them more effective at whatever they decide to pursue mm-hmm. and once i ask that question i just see answers absolutely everywhere and so let's talk about some of those answers and where you've grabbed them from, because things like network effects come up in your work, appreciative inquiry. Can we talk about, well, those two to start, but I'd love to talk about some of the other influences as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, network effects really came from, you know, I spent the last six years or so before coming here in Silicon Valley. So you can't be there and not be influenced. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And Silicon Valley is kind of obsessed with the network effects, you know, which is this idea that, that there's probably a formal definition, but the way that I, that I think of it is just that you can build a network or a platform that gets better, the bigger it grows. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the opposite of, uh, I think our intuition, you know, usually we think there's a trade-off. I could, I can serve a very small number of people very well. You know, I can have a personal high touch service or I can serve a very large number of people. Not so well with some sort of commoditized service or product and network effects turns that on its head um, where it says, you know, if you're on a, say uh, the classic example of social media network on a social media network, the bigger it grows, um, the more connections there are, the more people you can access, the more knowledge, the more uh, energy, the more excitement. It's like it, it continuously compounds on itself. Um, and I think the way that I've applied that is just that, you know, a, a, an individual's own productivity, like one person's own, say, just network of not just people, but projects and opportunities and revenue generating uh, sources can be thought of as a network and you as a human are just one node in that network. You're not the whole mm-hmm. thing, uh, which is kind of, I hope this liberating idea that you don't have to remember it all. You don't have to manage it all. You can just sort of participate in this network of things um, and not have to be the, the complete manager of everything. Okay. So if I were to look at, the main benefit of looking at network effects in terms of productivity, it's a freeing, uh, just sort of a freeing response, not necessarily, or how would this apply to the everyday person? So the everyday person is taking this and saying network effects, that's interesting, but I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. I don't have a multi-billion dollar company with a billion users. How does this work in my everyday life? Yeah, the, the analogy I like to use is, you know, In the past, we worked in factories and you were one worker at a factory, right? And people say, oh, but that, you know, that was the industrial age. Now we're creative knowledge workers. That doesn't apply. Now it's all different. But in a different way, it's absolutely the same. You know, when you go in your office and you sit at your desk, which is in a nice row, and you're sitting at your computer and you are are doing intellectual labor with your brain just as, um, as clearly as if you're hitting a piece of metal with a hammer, you know, um, it's really not that different, not as different as people think. Um, and so what I, what I ask people to do is to, to conceive of themselves, not as that worker any longer, 
but to step back from the production line and think of themselves as the foreman. Mm-hmm. Right? That foreman who he he kind of he's the he's the manager. He walks behind the workers. Maybe he's up on a catwalk. Uh, he's kind of overseeing what's happening in the factory and very rarely if ever doing the work himself. Mm-hmm. And the reason that's possible is basically that we have machine intelligent machines. Right? Like intelligence, which is the main way that we do intellectual labor is now not exclusively for humans, right? Like each of those things I mentioned, not just, okay, your, your smartphone, your computer are places where intelligence can be applied, right? But so is a social media network. You know, when I post something on Twitter, come back a few hours later and I have all these responses, intelligence was applied by that, that social media platform and those people that wasn't from me, right? Mm -hmm. Twitter is one node in my intelligence network. Um, And even simple things like when you put a blog post, you know, you put it aside for a few weeks and come back to it later. I I just did this with a post that I published yesterday. I I really got stuck and bogged down in a post I was writing on the future of libraries. I just, Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it finished. I put it in a folder in a digital drawer for, you know, actually like two or three months. And I came back yesterday and I was like, Oh, now it's completely clear what I should be doing here. So it's like that folder on my computer this may be a weird way to think about it, but intelligence was applied or at least value was applied just by me storing that thing for a while. Um, and, and, you know, all this that I'm describing, people do. We orchestrate this collection of different computers and people and social networks and all these different things. What I'm teaching people to do is just do it more intentionally and more strategically. Okay. So let's go into that article that you wrote on the libraries uh, because I saw the email came out today and how did tabling it for a couple of months, how did technology help you really finish that? Is it just a matter of you had a place to table it and you can trust that it was there or that was there sort of an amalgamation of other ideas that came from the technology as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great example. It's a number of things. I think the, the main thing is having a placeholder, mm-hmm. right? When you, like I notice when I talk to people, people have this sense, this idea that they have to maintain constant momentum, yeah. right? Like, oh yeah, I'm, I have a lot of momentum right now or, oh, I don't have momentum right now or, oh, I just got some momentum. Oh, I just lost momentum. As if momentum is this like, this like mist in the air, that you get sprayed with or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's, that's actually a disempowering frame. You know, it's empower. It feels empowering when you have it, whatever it is, but then because you, you, it seems like people feel like they don't really have control over it. It just sort of comes and goes when they quote unquote lose momentum. They just, Oh, I, I failed. There's nothing I can do. You know, the project languished, the project got blocked. Um, and I, I, my point of view is just, you know, don't rely on momentum at all. What if momentum was just not a factor? It just wasn't, wasn't even an element in your work. Mm-hmm. What, what, would you, what would you have to rely on if that was the case? And people usually go, oh my God, how would I even, yeah, what would be the basis of my productivity and my creativity if I couldn't rely on momentum? Um, and the way I think of it, I have a post on this, one of my most popular posts of all time. It's called Productivity for Precious Snowflakes. Um, <laughs> great, t- great title, by the way. Yeah. Um, and it's basically the idea that your, your state of mind, which really is what people are talking about when they say momentum is just, do you Mm -hmm. feel like you have momentum? Is your state of mind a momentum state of mind or not? Um, states of mind are extremely variable. You know, they, they really have more to do with your emotions than your intellect. And if you look at emotions, um, they're just constantly minute to minute changing. You know, you feel good one minute and then bad another. Um, one interesting way of seeing this is heart rate variability, which is yeah. sort of one indication. It's a healthy person is constantly changing, mm-hmm. right? You're not this steady state, like a machine like that. Um, and so because you're constantly changing, you know, people, people treat that. We're kind of going down the rabbit hole here now, but, um, uh, please do, because I'm going to ask you in a second, if you've ever done like a three day heart rate variability analysis to do per- this. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so people treat that variability like it's an enemy. Mm-hmm. They go, oh, I, yeah, I was feeling kind of, 
uh, I was just having a lot of feelings today, or I just felt a lot of like, um, I don't know, a lot of ups and downs today as if that's a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. That's what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. So another approach is to embrace that and to always just work on the thing that matches your state of mind. I love this. So just like match, like your state of mind, if that's the most important and rare and precious thing, just pick, instead of trying to force that state of mind into a different state of mind, which is painful and hard, just have a, a vast array of tasks before you and pick the one that you feel like doing. Right. Or sometimes, you know, you want to do something, not just a task, but a project, you know, wake up in the morning, choose the project out of this large array of projects that fits your mood, essentially. And the key thing you need to be able to do that is a project list. You need to have this dashboard with all of your different projects, each one at a different state of completion and have them sort of bookmarked so that you can grab that project and just continue exactly where you left off with no with no friction. There's many different avenues I want to go down here. <laughs> and the first I have to follow up on my earlier question. Have you ever measured your heart rate variability over three days just to see what the, the variation is like? Not in any systematic way. I was super into, into quantified self for a time and I did small experiments, but it's something that I'd, I'd like to return to. Is that something that, that you're into? I'll, I'll send you one after this. We can, we can talk about it, but it's, it's something that may be of interest to you, especially since you just brought it up. But let's, one question I want to ask before the organization of projects is a lot of the ideas you just presented seem to run in contradiction to the ideas of somebody like a Cal Newport, uh, deep work, having to carve out this life of solitude which seems very hard in a lot of people's lives. How do you respond to somebody who kind of says like, Hey, I believe in deep work. I believe three hours, solitary task. Uh, What do you say about that? Yeah. You know, I'm I'm sort of known as a, as a Cal Newport antagonist. Um, I've been introduced in interviews as the guy who doesn't like Cal Newport. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah. I want to hear more. Yeah. So, um, okay. A couple of things. So first of all, we're, we're actually pretty aligned. It's that, it's that sibling rivalry thing where you, you have the most beef with the people that are most similar to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but essentially my attitude towards this is that he, for his audience, you know, like he actually started with students. He started with young people, people very early in their career people just getting started, people trying to, you know, get their first job, stuff like that. That advice of deep work is directionally correct. And actually, I'd say for all of us, for the vast majority of people, we would benefit. They would benefit really from having larger blocks of time um, in uh, focused on one thing, from taking more time in isolation, actually working a, a deliverable to completion, um, so that, that's all really good advice. My, my opposition kind of comes because I've been through that. I've been across that Rubicon. Like I, I mastered that, that way of being that way of working and then took it too far. Right. Well, what did too far look like? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. So my, my second course, my first course was, was on GTD. It was essentially a, a direct translation of the book to a a video based online course. And it was super successful. Um, But as always happens, when you have a good project, my ego got big. And I thought, wow, I'm the genius here. I really have the the Midas touch and didn't appreciate how much, you know, David Allen's work was really the the entire basis of that success. So for my second uh, course, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, block off a couple months and, and go into deep work and create this course on habits out of my own research and my own ideas. And I did that. It was some of the deepest of deep work that I ever experienced, right? Two months, hardly saw my friends, my family, just did the classic deep work thing. Then another couple of months actually launching it and then teaching, starting to teach it and then promoting it. About four or five, six months after I fully committed to this. I realized the entire framing of the course was wrong. <laughs> the whole thing from the, the title, which was design your habits. I learned six months later that most people 
who see the title think, oh, this is for designers. And then they just don't even read the description, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So title was wrong, which of course I had never tested, never gotten any feedback on. The framing of the, the course, which was about building habits, was wrong. What's actually much more important to people is breaking bad habits. Yeah. So got that wrong. Everything, the layout of the course, the curriculum, the exercises, it was wrong, 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 wrong. And it was a huge waste of not only time, but money. I don't think I ever even broke even on the, the money that I invested to make the videos and do the design and all the different things. And after that experience, I just decided I am never going to do this again. I'm never going to go off and just uh, in my cave and create the next great whatever and then unveil it fully formed and perfected so that the adoring audiences can buy it because that just doesn't work. And the funny thing is I had read Lean Startup and I was in Silicon Valley and I knew about rapid prototyping and rapid iteration. I mean, during the same period, I was teaching a workshop on design thinking which is all about rapid feedback cycle. So it's, it's so funny how something can sink in intellectually and just like not actually be put in the, into practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what I would say is just, yeah, do the deep work thing, but then look for signs that you're doing it too far. And once you've gone too far, reel it back in and find a nice medium. Let's interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to talk a little bit about a product and company I'm in love with, and that is the V-Lite. My particular device is the Neuro Alpha, and let me tell you a little bit about my N of 1 benefits. Better sleep, better focus and less anxiety when it comes to things like public speaking, and increased ability to really drop into flow. But you can check out their website, which is full of all kinds of scientific articles and research in this world of intranasal photobiomodulation. And if you want to check out a device, we have a little bit of a coupon code for you. You can use the coupon code SUPERHUMAN to get 10% off your purchase. That's V-Lite, V-I-E-L-I-G-H-T dot com, and use the code SUPERHUMAN for 10% off. So do you find deep work, and I know you work with companies and executives, you find deep work to be extremely hard to implement in those types of people's lives? Oh, it's hard to implement in anyone's life. I mean, <laughs> That's, yeah. It's not an accident that Cal Newport is an academic. You know, he's a professor. That's, that's the classic academic life. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure he has tenure. <laughs> the, uh, the white ivory tower image, right? Yeah. I it mean, all comes. I don't want to. I don't want to to badmouth the academic, um, you know, academia, which I think is is incredibly valuable and important. Um, but you know, if you're working in a company that is trying to innovate, if you're working in a startup that is trying to validate your idea, if, I mean, all the the kinds of people I work with, at least, are on fast paced, rapid change cycles. You know, for for many of them, they cannot. It would be suicide for them to step back from that that constant flow of feedback and innovation to sort of go out in the woods and do their, their great masterpiece. So I don't know, I, I give people different advice. If I see someone that's too over on the distraction notification side, then I'll, I'll even recommend they read deep work. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of the people I work with are, are creators, are creatives. Um, and many of them actually would benefit from this idea that I have, which is intermediate packets, creating their works, in small little pieces and getting feedback on each one of those pieces, uh, which is sort of the opposite approach. Can we, uh, this is one of my favorite things that I've read that you've produced the intermediate packets. Can we expand a little bit more on sort of component building and what that looks like for people? Totally. Yeah. And that, that's exactly where it comes from is software mm-hmm. uh, components in software. It's this idea that you don't, you don't launch, you know, the next, uh, like huge, let's say like Adobe Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't launch that as one monolithic, enormous monster of a software program. You launch it in modules, little pieces. You know, you launch one little feature at a time, one little capability, one option. It's like little pieces that have very clear edges so that if something breaks, you don't have to go, oh my gosh, where in this gigantic jungle of code is the problem you can just test one little component at a time um, either before you publish the software or during or after right testing this is the great revolution and you know testing driven software development is you test at every stage testing used to be like right before hitting 
you know, upload, you would have one little testing stage. That's not the case anymore. The entire development process is driven by testing. Testing is the, the actual driving force. Mm -hmm. And how does this apply to personal productivity? Because people listening to this right now are saying, okay, that's interesting, but I'm not, you know, maybe they're not a coder, for instance. How could you use this as an executive, a finance professional, et cetera? Totally. Yeah. Um, so it starts with sort of a mindset shift, which is I want everyone to think of themselves as a creator. Like really that category. Oh no. Do you paint paintings, compose music or, you know, make videos, then you're a creative uh, and no one else is. No, every single person is. I used to think there were exceptions. I no longer do. You know, if you're an accountant, you are producing books, you know, accurate, effective, well-designed books. I mean, if you're an event coordinator, you are producing experiences, you're producing visuals, you're producing, you know, introductions of speakers, every single knowledge work profession, and virtually every profession is knowledge work these days, has some sort of digital artifact um, or paper artifact. And a big part of my work is convincing people that the design of those artifacts can be improved. It can be radically improved and that improving it makes a tremendous difference. I mean, let's take the most practical example, emails. People write emails all day. You know, the average knowledge worker spends 27% of their time, fully one quarter of their working hours uh, in email. And I look at my email inbox. I'm like 95% of these emails are just ineffective. They're just, they're just not well designed. You know, um, I'm thinking specifically of, of outreach emails. People send, you know, every day I receive emails to be on podcasts or speak at things or to be part of different things. And people don't, it's like they, they need to be trained. You know, there, there needs to be courses when you first get your first job on how to write emails. You know, there's the, the ADA, uh, the persuasive technique. First, you have to get their attention. That's the A. Mm -hmm. Second, you have to get their interest, which is the I. Third, you have to get their desire, which is D. And fourth, you have to get two. What is the last day? Action. Have it. action. You, action. you want them to take action. And people mess that up. The first thing they do is the action, what they want. And you're like, what? why would I even consider doing this thing for you? You haven't said who you are, what this has to do with me, why I should care. It's like, it's just, it's just very ineffective. Um, so I, I say if, if the thing you're doing a quarter of your working hours is just not very effective, it's very hard for your overall work to be effective. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take a step back now to that projects list you mentioned earlier? Entrepreneurs sometimes have hundreds of projects, if not thousands of ideas, right? I think of myself and you can wake up sometimes and have just an overwhelming amount of flow of ideas. How do you organize all of these? You want to focus on tasks or on ideas? Oh, uh, let's go with ideas. Yeah, that's that's really my specialty. So, so this is I really see myself as part of a movement. Um, I call it the second brain movement. Um, that mm -hmm. kind of fits with my brand, but you could think of it as the extended mind, uh, extended cognition, the exo the exocortex it's it's sometimes called and it's basically the idea that work can no longer fit inside a human mind mm -hmm. the the just the average the typical knowledge workers workload it's larger many times larger than what the human mind can can, can hold um and you know this this was the great discovery of gtd when you really start writing everything down you notice very quickly that the average person has dozens of projects. They don't have one or two or three, they have dozens. And when, and then when they start writing down their tasks, they see that they have hundreds of tasks, many hundreds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's why you need an external tool, either paper or really when you get into the hundreds, you need software, right? Yeah. To effectively manage hundreds of tasks. But then once you get into the realm of not tasks, but ideas, you have thousands, like you said. Really, we have thousands of ideas. And that's when you really have to use software and you need good software and you need a method. You need some sort of way to manage that flow because that's the thing. It's not just a stock, a static collection of ideas. It's constant. A constant flow of some ideas getting 
used or implemented, some dying and no longer being relevant, some arising out of your daily experience. It's this, it's like a, it's like a raging torrent. It's a river of ideas that you have to manage. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is why my, my work is focused these days on, I have a course uh, called building a second brain, uh, which is really my primary focus. Um, I'm writing the book version of it. Um, we were about to, to launch local meetups, so you can find a, a meetup in, in a major city near you. It's really my complete focus. And it's the idea that you can build a second brain. You can, you can use technology, not just as this annoying tool that you have to use, um, but as an extension of your mind, an extension of your dreams, an extension of your goals, an extension of your interests and your priorities. And that once you do that, your capacity to take on life, to take on the the challenges and the problems, but also the opportunities and the amazing experiences equally at such a radically higher level of effectiveness that it completely transforms your life. I mean, it it really is a profound shift that that people are are experiencing. And and my my mission is basically to just advance that that shift. As someone who's in this course right now, uh, first off, I'm benefiting greatly from it, but also I would love for you just to share some of these elements in terms of how you help people get organized. Uh, you don't have to share all of the course, of course, but you know, what are some of the elements within the course that you take people through? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm happy to talk about it um, at, at, at whatever level of detail, but um, essentially there's, there's four steps. Mm -hmm. right to this river of information there are stages um, and they spell the acronym code c-o-d-e first you need to collect right you need to collect your ideas in in one central place Uh, second you need to organize they need to be in some sort of logical you know structure Uh, third distill um, you know, ideas are more voluminous than tasks. The task, the task is usually just do this. It's one line. An idea can be huge. It can be a thousand words or more. So you need to distill it, right? You need to distill it down to something that you can just see at a glance. Um, and third, express, right? Ideas are most valuable, not when they're sort of archived away in cold storage somewhere, but when they're out in the world, they're being circulated, they're being used, they're being talked about. Uh, which gets back to that idea of being a creator. You know, really to to fully leverage your ideas, you need to get them out in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so th- those are the four stages that we move through. Uh, and really, I have kind of a different technique for each of them. Um, for for collect, not so much. Collect is really just you have just you have to get in the habit of collecting. And I have some 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 tips for how to do that. Um, but the big one I'd say is organize. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the people that come to my course have some sort of digital note taking practice. Often they've been using Evernote or Bear or Microsoft OneNote or Apple Notes or one of these programs for for a while. And these programs make it very easy to collect, very easy to save a note, right? But then before you know it, you have hundreds of notes, in some cases thousands, and you're just like, well, how? Like, how do I make sense of this? It's way too much to even deal with. It actually seems to make the information overload worse. Right, because now you, yeah. you have all these valuable things staring you in the face. <laughs> I'm gonna ask your organization for this because if you look at a guy like I picked out now two people, but Michael Hyatt has a tagging system that could be hundreds of you know tens of tags, right? And that could be overwhelming in itself. How do you make this simple? Yes, and it's very funny you mentioned Michael Hyatt because my. The first thing that I ever wrote on this topic, the very first thing is a post. It's still live. You can find it. It's called Tagging is Broken. <laughs> and it was a rant. I, I was on Medium one day. This was when I had just started blogging in like 2015 or so. Um, and I, I was on Medium and they have like the top ranked articles. And I saw one and it said, how to organize Evernote. And I thought, oh, I, I really have some thoughts on this. Let me check it out. And it was by this guy, I think his name was Thomas Honeyman. And he had been inspired by some that post that you referenced that Michael Hyatt wrote. And he laid out this, this huge tagging system, you know, with multiple levels and this, this hierarchical structure where you tag everything by 
you know, who, what, when, where, how, all these things. And it was super popular, had a, thousands of, you know, of upvotes and all these things. And I was just outraged. <laughs> I was like, this is totally wrong. This is the wrong way to organize Evernote. It makes sense for a couple of product, like hyper productivity nerds who spend all day organizing tags. But for all the real humans out there, it makes no sense. And right then and there, I sat down. I did a little bit of, you know, organizing my notes, of course. Um, but then I, I sat down and I wrote a rant on why it was wrong. Um, and it did super well. People, sort of the other, the, the left behind people, everyone else, which turns out, I think, to be a majority of people were like, yeah, you're, you know, this, this is really speaking to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but then, of course, I had to, I had to, people responded, box, responded back saying, well, what is the right way then? Like, you, you knocked down this guy. What is your idea? And I was like, oh, shoot. Okay, now I have to propose something. And that's where <laughs> the brain started. Um, but to answer your question, um, the simple answer is notebooks. Uh, notebooks and folders, depending on which note taking app you use, they can call them different things. Um, but, and it's funny because this is the original way. I mean, this is how we store things on paper, right? In, in file boxes and in, in hanging file folders. And it's just so funny because with the rise of software, people went, oh my gosh, we don't need folders anymore. We can have this like ever changing network, this matrix of multi dimensional notes and all these fancy things. And yet, if, if you look at how people actually think, and my experience of this really came with productivity coaching, like when you have to sit down with next to someone and actually help them organize, you see that the simplest decision is just where does this go? One single location. Um, but the, and, and then later I came across research. Um, I have a post on this, I think called, ooh, I'm gonna have to look into what post this is, but basically, um, Humans really benefit from having one item stored in one location, right? And mm-hmm. even when they go to retrieve it, it's easier, right? Because th- there's this thing where, you know, with search, you have, to, you have to remember directly what the thing is, right? If I want to search, I can do one search on Spotlight on my computer and find any file on my computer, right? That seems simpler. It's actually not because I have to remember a specific term from that file. That's the, the worst thing for human brains is instant recall is the thing we are absolute worst worst at what we're really good at is recognition and what you see this is what the research has shown as you navigate your file system um you are at, even though it seems to be high friction you're actually reminding yourself of what is there right mm-hmm. as you navigate each level of your file system it's like all these little cues and reminders and things that you are being reminded of um, are sort of recontextualizing what is in the system in the first place. So sometimes you end up navigating to somewhere that you don't even remember, like you didn't even remember was there in the first place, but because of all the cues that you encountered along the way, you end up getting there. Mm -hmm. So the system that I teach is called Para, P-A-R-A, and it's based on folders and notebooks, just like I I just described, except with a twist. (laughs) And that twist is it's flat. It's very, very flat. So mm-hmm. instead of this endless hierarchy where you have folder and then like seven levels of subfolders, which is really where you get into trouble, where you have these like tiny, tiny little micro categories that are so tiny that they're like little silos. You have no more than essentially three levels, right? You have, so I'll use Evernote as an example. You have stacks. Inside stacks, you have notebooks. Inside notebooks, you have notes. And mm-hmm. that's it. You can't nest. Nesting is the enemy here. You can't nest notes within other notes. You can't have notebooks within other notebooks. You can't have nothing like that. It's just one, two, three, A, B, C. Um, And people sometimes rebel against this because they're like, no, I need some special exception. Um, But when we dive into it and I really, you know, walk them through, is this really an exception? Really, is your work so special and unique and complex that you can't fit it in three levels of hierarchy? Once we really get into it, they find that actually it's not the case. So the elements of Para, I just want to touch on a couple of them. So Para, projects, area, resources, archives, right? Uh, So difference between projects and areas for people. I know this one kind of gets hung up every once in a while. So do you mind just going through that real quick? Yeah, of course. This is really the big one. 
it's it's not it's it, it's quite a mindset shift because when you look at the whole range of what people manage in their work, um, mm-hmm. they might call it all projects, uh, or maybe they call it just to dos or tasks. Mm-hmm. But really, there's there's a very clear distinction, which is you have projects and you have areas of responsibility. Projects begin and end; areas don't. That's the simplest distinction. Projects are are discrete in time. They have a kickoff date and they have an end date. They begin and they end, right? There, there is some sort of completion, which is pretty straightforward for people to understand. But the other category areas they are, are really like processes. They're never ending. They're, they're areas of your life, responsibilities that you have in your life that you have to manage on a continuous, ongoing basis. Basically, they, they continue indefinitely, right? Mm. So examples are like health. Right. Your health is not a project. Right. It never ends. There's no date at which you go, oh, health finished. Oh, never have to think about that again. Right. Mm-hmm. Same thing with your finances. Your finances till the day you die, you are going to have to manage in some way your finances. Um, relationships, right? Like we all know people who try to re- manage their relationships as projects. It doesn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> Those are short-term relationships, I guess. Those tend to be short-term, very <laughs> transactional relationships. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the relationships that really matter are indefinite. They just continue forever. Um, and this l- simple distinction, projects end, areas don't, changes everything. Because... You the, the way that you manage something that, that continues indefinitely has to be fundamentally different than how you manage projects. Completely different tool set, different mindset, different approach, different attitude, different ways of setting goals. It's just radically different. It's like black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, and confusing the two actually leads to a lot of pain and a lot of frustration. Like we mentioned the example with, you know, managing your relationships with projects leads to pain. I see that with health, you know, people who set a goal, which is really goals are for projects. Like I'm going to lose this many pounds and they fast and they work out. And it's this very like drive towards the goal thing, but then they don't institute any of the background processes to maintain that. So what is the classic result is the yo-yo diet, mm-hmm. the yo-yo where you get right back to where you were once the goal, the goal, it's funny, the goal actually becomes a negative because as soon as you, there's something called, I think it's goal release. That, that feeling of intense satisfaction and relief when you, when you reach a goal often means you also release the habits. You release mm-hmm. the behaviors and go right back to where you started. <laughs> so the resources area is for you, and I think you give one of these examples once, resources area is where we collect uh, information on hobbies, I guess. Do I have that right? Or things that we have general interest in? Um, that would be the resources, the, yeah. the R and para. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so in the resources area, I'm curious, what does Tiago Forte have in his resources area at this moment? I'll tell you a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. So resources is really just almost everything else that doesn't fit into projects area. So I have looks like... Um, 104 resource notebooks. <laughs> uh, qu- quick, just a couple of quick highlights. Yeah. So starting from the top, I'll just give some examples. Um, things I'm, I'm interested in, activism, agile, attention, behavior design, brand identity, breathing, business cards, camping, uh, checklists, chocolate, Christmas presents, climate, community building crowdsourcing, crypto, culture. That was just A, B, and C. <laughs> wow. Wow. And you got hundreds of them. That's great. It makes me feel a bit normal when I when I look at my resources because I have a similar list of interests, so to speak. One of the things I, I've read from you recently or you know, came across my Kindle was the Mesa Method. And an experience that you've had with the Mesa Method, first off, I would love to hear a little bit more about what is the Mesa method and how does that differ from a typical design sprint? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Mesa and in, in Portuguese, which is, it comes from Brazil, mm-hmm. it would be Mesa. The S is like a Z. So I'm not sure which one to, ah. but <laughs> um, is a, it's a sprint methodology. It's, it's, I'd say part of this new generation of 
started with design sprints. Now it's all kinds of sprints. You know, hackathons are included in that. Uh, startup weekends are included in that. There, there's a whole movement. <clears throat> I think, though, that it's one of the most interesting. Meza, coming from this Brazilian company of the same name, is one of the most interesting because, I mean, first, that it comes from the developing world. <clears throat> I think that's something that is just really unusual. Productivity is such a industrialized world, developed world, you know, um, large urban center phenomenon that it's just rare to have a, a new methodology come from the, de the developing world. And I think it's important. You know, it's actually, that makes it, it's more, it's more feminist. I think the, the mm -hmm. founder and the whole first group of employees are women. So it has a, you know, instead of like talking about feminism and like, oh, we need more women in this or that, or this percent, like quotas and this percentage of that has to be women. It's just like, no, this is just made by women. And it's clear in what it is and the spirit of it that it's made by women. And it's not something that's enforced, which I really, really liked. Um, it's more climate conscious. It's more socially conscious. It's more, um, you know, just more conscious in general, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's this five day, I think the default is five days methodology where a group of people, stakeholders, um, half of them more or less, or a bit less than half are from the client company. Um, and there's always some sort of uh, client or sponsoring organization that has a, a big challenge to solve. And it has to be big. It can't be like, oh, we need a new marketing campaign. It's got to be like, we want to grow our company by 25% next year while using less packaging and having half the environmental footprint. Like an almost impossible challenge is the best kind. Um, and then you, you, so the group of around 15 people, um, they, they basically sequester themselves in an isolated location with no devices, no computers for five days. Um, around five to seven are from the client and the rest are subject matter experts. So experts in, in that example, say packaging in climate change in marketing and in say manufacturing. And then the rest are makers. The rest are like videographers, designers, coders, people who know how to actually create, you know, create artifacts. And over the course of five days, it sounds crazy, but they go from a brief, some sort of mission, like the one I just said, you know, increase sales while reducing environmental impact. They go from just a brief all the way to a prototype. Mm -hmm. uh, and the prototype has to be high fidelity. It has to be something that you could, you could really put in a customer's hands. You could actually show to someone, and we do this as well during the week or sometimes in the week during the weekend following the five days. We put it into the hands of real people and we ask, does this actually solve the problem? Um, and it's just, it's a remarkable way to avoid that bureaucracy. You know, like for, for I don't know if you've worked in a large company before or if you're, yeah. I'm sure many of your listeners have, but it's like, oh, we should do this thing. A month later, first meeting, a month after that, second meeting, two months after that, oh, now we have an RFP. Two months after that, we have our vendor. And it's like each meeting, you have to remind yourself and everyone, why the heck did we do this? Why is this important? Um, and the ability to do that in five days is this, like speaking of momentum, actually, this is where I would, I would change my mind and say momentum can be magical. Like when you see something that you just came up with on a Tuesday come to life on a Friday, your sense of what is possible in the world just explodes. Mm -hmm. And the one of the things I found interesting was the avenue of sequestering people in a remote location. How much does that affect it? Does that just force you to interact with people across the table? I also saw illustrations of the table within the, the book that you put out. But how much does the sequestering in a remote location affect everything? It's critical. <clears throat> Absolutely critical. Um, Meza, actually, the, the company, they have an online course now. Mm -hmm. uh, links in my ebook and in the blog posts that I've written to that course. Um, and they're also now starting to do in-person trainings. Just, just earlier this month, they did two, I think, three-day trainings in somewhere in New York, in New York State, um, to train people in this methodology. And it's like the most rigorous methodology. They're not just like, oh, here's some guidelines. It's like this, it's like it's almost like a Japanese art. It's like this is the exact precise way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've done, I think, uh, closing in on 200 of these 200 week long sprints over five or six years, which is an incredible amount of experience. Wow. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, one of the things that they, it's, it's a key part of the methodology. It's called the leave me alone wall. They have this wall. It looks like, you know, those little, those things you, you hang on the back of your closet that have little pockets for shoes. Yeah. Um, they ha- it looks just like that, but it's for cell phones. So at the beginning of every single session and every day, you have to go up and your name is on it, which is key, right? Because <laughs> you, can, you can look at a glance and see who didn't put their phones. Mm-hmm. Right. I love it. The social, di- the social engineering is just genius. Um, but you put your phone in there and there's also no computers at the table. And you know what it reveals is like as much as remote work is cool and it, as much as asynchronous work is cool, you know, doing all these things by Zoom calls and Slack and email, there is a, a, a fundamental amount of friction that you have with all those tools that cannot be avoided. Right. And when you sit around a table with 15 people in, you know, 10 hours a day for five days, that's 50 hours over five days. Think about in a normal office environment, how long would it take? Think, think, just think about this as an experiment. How long would it take for you to get 50 hours of focused thinking and, and talking and working with the same group of people? Like if ever. <laughs> yeah. I'm going through a hundred days plus because you're going to get 30 minutes of maximum attention before somebody needs to check their phone. Right. Exactly. That's- that's exactly. And there's something where, where it's greater than the sum of its parts. What mm-hmm. happens in hour 10, if those hours are continuous, is very different from what happens in your 20th, 30 minute meeting. You know, um, th- there is this, this momentum as a group. It's, it's really about the group. There's a there's almost like a belief forming. It's like a belief forming dynamic. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is why, by the way, it's so critical that there are key, not just representatives, but key decision makers from the company have to be there the whole week because they, the the three or four or five of them, they come out of that week having seen the whole process beginning to end, all the the options that were considered, that were considered the considerations, the, the problems, the challenges, seeing all those having been overcome, they, they come out of that meeting like a rocket, you know, like a spaceship with so much friggin' belief in this thing that they then go to their organization as an evangelist. You know, they go to their board of directors, they go to their CEO, they go to their boss, not just, Oh, here's an idea the consultants came up with, like kind of like hedging their bets in case the boss doesn't like the idea, which mm-hmm. we've all seen in organizations too, you know, Absolutely. Oh, the consultants came up with this. I, I don't really know if it's good. Um, or the person below me, my re- one of my reports came up with this. It's like every <laughs> level of the hierarchy hedges their bets and re- tries to hedge their risk. Instead, this person is like, this is the answer. This is the future of our company. This is the future of our product. We have to do it. It's, it's night it. and day. It's just crazy. <laughs> I love it. Tiago, I want to respect your time, but before I get into the final six questions, let's come back to the future of work because you mentioned that you moved to Mexico city to embrace sort of what you believed is the future of work. What does work look like for the, the knowledge worker, so to speak in 10 or 20 years time? Are we all in this gig economy or is it, you know, are we all outsourced to AI, so to speak? I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the future of work, it's going to be not so much about these individual trends. In fact, I think all of these trends from, um, from remote work to more gig project-based contractor work to more people being freelancers, even including um, people having online products and side gigs and passive income. Like there's a couple dozen of these trends are all really just symptoms of a deeper trend um, which I'm extremely biased is, is the, what I'm focused on these days. I think really the future of work is humans doing less of it, mm-hmm. you know, humans from the line workers and chugging through every little task of those. Um, and this is already happening. It's been happening for years to elevating themselves to more managerial, more creative, more interpersonal, more innovative, uh, you know, Functions. We're going to spend more and more of our time because we have to. People who are focused on the really detailed small work are going to find that, that they're more and more in direct competition with computers. And we're going to have to sort of climb the value ladder 
um, by necessity, but also by desire. It's just, it's more fulfilling, more interesting work as well. Um, and machines, intelligent machines are kind of eating the bottom end of that, of that ladder. And they're going to keep eating it, keep eating it, keep eating it. Um, I think the key difference is that it's not necessarily adversarial. You know, machines are going to, are going to be able to do our work way, way, way before they're able to decide what that work is. Mm -hmm. There's going to be this huge period, maybe hundreds of years where they can do tasks. They still can't, you know, look at the whole range of opportunities in the economy and then decide to pursue them. Um, and, and, and even more so before they can recruit other humans and recruit other organizations and sell and pitch and evangelize and all these things that are very human. Um, and that creates a huge opportunity for people that can leverage machines. I mean, this is, this is clearly the answer is the, um, what do they call that? The, like the man machine hybrid, the mm -hmm. people who are really going to succeed and, and find themselves just with unprecedented opportunities are the people who can leverage machines, who can have something like a second brain, who really can leverage social media and social networks, who can, uh, who can code, who can code little bots and little uh, software programs that can take over parts of their work. These are the categories of people that are just going to find themselves completely inundated with opportunities. Excellent. At this point, I want to transition over into just the final six rapid fire questions. The first one, what's the favorite, your favorite piece of technology that you've purchased in the past year? My favorite piece of technology, I think, has been the H1N Zoom, made by Zoom, um, audio reporter. For podcasts or for just your own courses? Actually, All neither. Really, really for live action video. Um, I decided awesome. this year to learn video and, and I always need a project to learn something. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to, to film a, a short amateur documentary of my dad uh, and his work. He's an artist and his, his work has been a huge inspiration for mine. Um, and you know what the, what the H1N does? It's not expensive. It's I think a hundred bucks or so. It allows you to easily mic someone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I put it in your, if it's in a pocket, it's quite small. And then you have a loud mic, which goes up your shirt and I can just clip it here in a few seconds. Right. Um, then I can film on my iPhone, which is a full featured, amazing professional quality camera. Right. The one thing the iPhone can't do, and I don't know if it will ever be able to do is capture audio really close to you. That's the missing piece, right? Mm -hmm. And without that, any environment that you're shooting in, you have that you have background noise or you can't hear them very well. Um, I actually think someone, if it doesn't exist already, someone is, is going to invent, like, imagine the design of the AirPod, but as a lab mic. Yeah. It's going to be a completely wireless synced uh, automatically with your phone that you can just walk up, clip it right to someone's shirt and start filming. And the, the synchronization is going to happen automatically. It's really a game changer. That would be, that'd be very useful in my own life, I imagine. But uh, second question, how do you unwind? I unwind first with easy tasks. Mm -hmm. I find that I can't go from my deepest focus straight to relaxing. I'll just, you know, lounge on the couch, just look staring off into space with my mind like whirls. Um, I need a down ramp. I need a, a series of progressively easier and less focused tasks um, that I can sort of slowly sort of, it's like changing gears on a car, like not going from, I actually don't know how the gears work, but <laughs> from one yeah. to, the, to the other end, but kind of stepping them down one at a time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, my attempts at relax relaxation fail. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, that's the opposite of what most people do. Most people start the day with their easiest tasks and slowly ramp up. And I've found the best is actually to do your most difficult task early in the morning when you're your highest energy and then slowly do easier and easier tasks as your energy fades. What's your favorite holiday or vacation destination? You know, I really like retreats. I really, really like retreats. Either like self-created retreats, you know, go to a cabin with a, a family member or my wife, um, or something more structured like a meditation retreat, or even like a, a course that happens like in an isolated place out in nature. 
just because if I don't very intentionally disconnect, um, I remain connected. Uh, and I, you know, if I go to a say, vacation in a different city, unless I have planned activities and some sort of structure, I'll just default to working. Work mm-hmm. will just happen. <laughs> I'm the same way. What book has significantly impacted your life and your ability to perform in it? The big one right now is a book called The Body Keeps the Score. <clears throat> it's a book by um, Bessel van der Kolk, I think is his name. It's a Dutch guy. Um, it's really one of the most remarkable things I've ever read. Uh, it's a book on trauma. Mm-hmm. It's his experience of decades running a, a network of trauma centers. Um, and, and what he's discovered about how trauma, which really we all have, that's been, that's been my great discovery. You know, I didn't have any big sort of traumatic, like single incident in my childhood, in my youth. And so I thought, oh no, trauma is for like someone else. That's for like people who were abused in very specific ways. Yeah. Um, and that is a, a, a different kind of trauma. That's acute trauma, but there is a, a sort of a, a background trauma to, to just living life. You know, the, the series of disappointments and frustrations and pains that we experience, they accumulate. They slowly accumulate like a little, like a little, like a little fungus somewhere. Um, and they start shaping how we react to people, how much we're willing to trust, um, the risks and the challenges we're willing to take on, the uncertainty that we're able to handle. I mean, it really, it's a lens on, on absolutely our entire life. Um, and from reading this book, which I just finished a few days ago, um, there is an element of trauma treatment that is going to become a major theme of my work uh, going forward. Sounds like another book I have to pick up. So thank you for that <laughs> one. <laughs> I have to reword this last question for you. The original question is what is the best thing you've done to enhance your productivity? But I feel like I have to reword that given who I'm talking to. What's your number one tool in your toolbox for productivity? If you meditation. can only have one. Meditation. What type of meditation? I have most experience with Vipassana. Okay. Um, I've been on a couple of retreats. Uh, it's really actually the only one I've studied. Maybe I should branch out. Um, but meditation is the absolute, and it feels like such a cliche these days. Everyone says meditation. Um, but I occasionally stop doing it. And for one or two days, I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I guess I've, I've grown past that. And then usually like the afternoon of the third day, my life falls to pieces. I just, uh, my, my entire mental state fragments into a million pieces and I'm just so miserable. Um, I don't know what to say. I don't know how people live without it. I don't know how I live without it. It's a fundamental to my well being. Tiago, this has been an absolute pleasure. And I want to thank you for creating your courses because I've enjoyed, well, the two that I've tried so far and I've enjoyed a lot of your writing. So thank you for everything that you do. And, both enhancing my productivity, but also everyone else out there listening. Absolutely, Boomer. It's my it's my absolute pleasure, really. And um, I'm just really happy to talk to you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Where can people find out more about you? The easiest way is my website, which has links to everything else. Um, it's Forte Labs, F-O-R-T-E-L-A-B-S dot C-O, not dot com dot C-O. And there's links there to my, I have a series of eBooks. I have online courses. I have my blog. Um, if you want to find out more about live workshops and speaking and corporate consulting, that's, that's kind of the gateway to just the whole, the whole thing. Excellent. We'll link to all of this in the show notes, but Tiago, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show today. One final ask from me, superhumans, actually two. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with a friend, share it with all of your friends. And if you really enjoy the episode and you really enjoy what we're doing here at Decoding Superhuman, head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating with a little comment. All ratings are extremely appreciated and I appreciate you for listening. Have an absolutely epic day, superhumans.